not a dog. <laughs> we should be beggars. No, we shall. I'll get a situation. I'll work. I'll get money that way. Didn't I always say to your father, time and again, whatever you do, don't go to law against Wakeham, didn't I? What's this then? A week? Where's the corpse? Shame on you, Jeremy. How can you be droll at a time like this? Don't stop your grieving, woman. It's not a child we've lost, it's a lawsuit. Precisely, Father. I mean, we could bury a dead child, but what do we do with a lawsuit? We rise above it, lad. We rise above it. Won't you sit down, Father? You look so hot. And Wakeham thinks he's beaten Tulliver, he must think again. Tulliver still has a trick or two up his sleeve. Right, but how do we stand now, financially? Well, I admit a man could wish his bank book made better reading. But we've lived on before and we shall do it again for a week or two. Well, only a week or two? But the money you owe... Till the profits from the mill repay Furley's advances. Yeah, it's hot in here. Shall I fetch you some water, Father? Yeah. Who's Furley? He's a reasonable man. Aye, but who is he? You'll not be slow to see the profit in this. But who is he, Father? He owns the mortgage on the mill. A home's mortgage? Ah, long since. Oh, Jeremy, it's even worse than I thought. How is Mr. Fairley going to help, Father? He's going to purchase the estate and keep me on as a tenant. But that's wonderful. Oh, you all stop snivelling and smile again. But wouldn't Mr. Fairley take the house from us? If he buys the mill, he'll own our home. Well, not turn us out, Bessie. How can you be so sure of everything? Has Furley told you about the mill? As good as. I'm waiting on his word now. Oh, what a relief. Mother will be able to stay and the bailiff won't be in. But don't we need the money now? At once? Look, I've not had your schooling, lad. But I'm a long way from being a fool. If Furley keeps me on as a tenant, he'll advance the money. And he'll be repaid later out of the profits of the business. At our interest. Oh, he's a businessman. But he'll not refuse an offer like this. And one of that dreadful man? That Dickinson? Dickinson? What, the landlord or the Marquis of Granby? Well, what's he got to do with this? Oh, he lent your father money to repay your Aunt Plague. Oh, you mean you borrowed money from that man? That pimply beer drink? Oh, for heaven's sake, father! Tom! Would you rather have ruined your Aunt Moss and her husband? And now I suppose Dickinson wants his money back, too. It's all dealt with. How? Here's security. Well, what kind of security? A bill on the sale of the furniture. The furniture? Oh, how could you? How could you? All our things in strange Oh, we shall have nothing left. Nothing. We shall all go to the workhouse. Now, so much I've done. We shall be sold up and go to the workhouse to think you should have married me to bring me to this, Tulliver. Can you talk so, Mother? Oh, the fellow only did what he thought was right. Aye, uh, that was wrong. Again and again. You young pup! Oh, face the simple facts, Father. You've disgraced my family. You've made my poor sisters the gossip of the girl. They've had to sit by and watch while you spent my fortune on your silly lawsuits. Stop this. <laughs> Why aren't your precious family here now? Be quiet, Maggie. I shall not. Are the aunts just going to stand by and let this happen to Father. Nothing has happened and nothing will. <laughs> I wouldn't take charity from those harpies anyway. If you cared about anyone but yourself, you'd oh, make them God. help. Maggie! <laughs> Maggie! I know I behaved badly and I'm sorry, but I stand by what I said. It's always the same with you, isn't it? Always setting yourself up above everyone else. You ought not to have spoken to Mother like that. And you ought not to have shouted at Father. You always think you know better than anyone, but you're always wrong. Why can't you leave it to me to take care of everything? But the aunt should be made to help us. Why should they? Why should they give their money to someone who can't take care of his own? Do you feel no pity for father at all? It's no good standing up for father when you know he's blamable for everything. He's a broken man, Tom. I don't think he's well. He's so red in the face all the time. It's me who's been put to the worst disadvantage by his lack of prudence. He's made us all poor, Maggie. It's intolerable to think how everyone will look down on us because of his stupidity. Was it stupid to fight for what he believed in? Father? It's from Mr. Furley, Father. A messenger just delivered it. Oh, now you'll see. This'll stop you snivelling, woman. No. Oh, Jeremy, what does he say? No, he can't. He can't do it. What? He can't do it! Oh. Can't, can't do what was he can't. Father! Oh. 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 <laughs> He's 
He's lying quiet now. But someone should sit with him. His eyes are open, but he seems to see nothing. He doesn't recognise me. Now, don't alarm yourself too much, Tom. Your father's had a stroke. It can affect the memory, for a time. Is that the letter you spoke of? Oh, I... We had to tear it to get it from his hand. May I? He read it, cried out and fell down. First I thought he was dead. Who's this man, Furley? Oh, well, when he lost the lawsuit, father was pinning all his hopes on Furley buying the mill and keeping him on as a tenant. Now he's written to say that he too is hard pressed for money. He sold all his securities to lawyer Wakeham. Aye, including the mortgage on our property. So you see, there's no hope for us now. Now, my boy, there's always hope. Father and lawyer Wakeham are sworn enemies, Dr. Turnbull. We're ruined. But surely that means that Mr. Wakeham owns the mill. No, Aunt, he owns the mortgage. And that means the bailiff. And pull it. Won't you come nearer the window? There's such a pleasant breeze. No, thank you. Here I am and here I stay. Others may catch their death if they wish. If the doctor orders jelly for Mr. Tulliver Bessie, be sure and let me know. Thank you, Sophie, but there's been no talk of jelly yet. He'll not get up again, you mark my words. He'll be all childish like Mr. Carr was, poor man. And have to be fed with a spoon. Sophie Pullett, you don't chatter about people's complaints till it's quite indecent. Dr. Turnbull says his memory's gone a long way back. He hardly knows Tom at all, because he's thinking of him when he was little. I do recall you had some cut glasses for jelly, Betty. A dozen, Susan, as you very well know. And it's no good you eyeing Bessie's silver either. Everything will be put to auction and bid for in a proper manner. La, Jane, how fiery you are today. How like a babe. If I understand correctly, we've come together to decide what's to be done. Now disgrace has fallen on poor Bessie and her family. But does everything have to go to the bailiff? Even the china? Exactly. Before the bailiff comes, could we not divide the best things between us? Well, I have no objection at all to buying your silver teapot, Bessie, even if the spout is bent. And I know Sister Pullet has her eye on the spotted tablecloths. I was always partial to your damask, Bessie. I would like to keep my china, though. I bought it when I'm married, and there's never been a bit broken, because I always wash it myself. Oh, it drives me past patience hearing you all talking. Buying in this, keeping back that. You do well to remember, Bessie, that you may not have a bed to sleep on by the end of the week. Oh, come now, Jane. Let's not make things too dark. I'm not in front of the girl. It's time Maggie knew her condition in life and why she's having to suffer for her father's faults. A deal more humility from you, young lady, wouldn't go amiss. Your father's not only brought disgrace on your family, but mine as well. Now oh, it's time for you and your brother to let us see the fruits of all this expensive learning that's brought your mother to beggary. You should be humble and grateful to your aunts for trying to help, not jumping to your feet at every opportunity to be bad-tempered and insolent. I've said nothing. Your disposition says it all, madam. If you think it's such a disgrace to your family that we should be sold up, wouldn't it be better to prevent it? Maggie, hush. Well, if you and Aunt Pullet and Aunt Dean are going to leave Tom and me money in your wills, why don't you give it now instead? Maggie Tulliver, learning has not improved you one bit. What use would it be to save the furniture when there's all the law debts still to be paid? And why should we squander our money, pray? on a man who's already proved how wicked and wasteful he's been with his own. Then why do you come here talking and interfering and scolding Maggie, us? Maggie! Keep away from us, all of you! Well, my father's better than any of you. He would have helped you if you'd been in trouble. Miss, you go too far. Keep your money, we'll do without it. You've not seen the end of your troubles with that girl, Bessie. She's beyond anything for boldness. No more than I've always said. She'll come to no good. Come, let's waste no more time with her. We have business here, sisters. I've been thinking. And it seems to me it would help matters if I spoke to Dean and asked him to get guest and company to buy the mill and keep Bessie and Tulliver on as tenants. If he lives. Oh, yes. But would they buy it? Well, I don't see why not. 
As it is an auction, sister, there will be other interested parties. Well, of course there will, but they don't count. Well, who in St Ogg's could outbid guests? What about Lawyer Wakeham? Supposing he wants to buy the mill. Oh, you silly goose, Sophie. Why ever should he? Oh, but supposing he does, sisters. What then? If Mr Wakeham buys the mill, it'll kill Tulliver. It'll kill him. I know it will. In here. Look who's come visiting. Why don't you recognise him? It's Bob Jakin. Bob! Hello, Miss Maggie. Have you come to visit Father? Oh, Bob, that is kind. He might recognise an old friend. Well, I, I don't know so much about the friend, Miss Maggie. <laughs> Proper trial I was to your father. <laughs> Always eating his turnips and stealing your mother's pies. Oh, I'm sure that's all forgiven now. Come and sit down. Uh, here, Bob. Remember that? Oh, the knife, yes. I'll give it to you. And you got into a rage one day and threw it down on a cow pack for me to pick up. Which I didn't. Picked it up myself after you'd gone. Little blades broke it, see? But I'll not have a new one put in. Because they cheat me and give me another knife instead. There's not another like it in the county. So how are you, Bob? Oh, I'm well enough, miss. Got work at Torrey's Mill now. Pays well, but bulls are days out as long as pigs chitlins. <laughs> Like a fact, Mr. Tom, I had a rare bit of luck last week. Doused a fire at Torrey's, and the gentleman was so pleased he gave me ten sovereign. Ten? My word. And then I hear this gossip, see, I hear me old master's in, in trouble and broke. Does the old county know? Well, I thinks to myself, Miss Maggie and Mr. Tom, well, they'll be wanting some help from old friends and neighbours. Well, Mr. Tom, he give me the only present they ever had in my life. So, well, there's only nine of them now. I bought me mother a goose for dinner. But I want you to have them, Mr. Tom. I walked six miles to bring you these. If you don't take them, I think you still bear me a grudge for throwing the knife in the cow pan. You're the kindest person in the world, Bob. But we can't take your little fortune from you. Thanks very much, Bob. I'll never forget this. And if ever we need help, well, we know we can depend on you. Well, that's what you'd like, isn't it? To have us depend on you as a friend. Oh, Mr. Tom, that's what I'd like. But please take the money. A little slice of my luck and no harm done. Nine sovereigns, Bob. It's... Well, it's not really enough to help us. But it might do you some good. Oh, I can get bags more where that come from, Mr. Tom. <laughs> I'm a bit of a rogue on a quiet seat. Very convenient it was me being around to douse that fire at Torrey's. You mean you lit the fire? <laughs> oh, you're a rogue, Bob, here. You'll get transported one of these days. Uh, won't you come upstairs and see Father now, Bob? Mother's with him. I know she'd like to see you too. Well, so long as you don't mind me boots on your carpet, Miss Maggie. No. Bob. Thank you. Are you well, Uncle? I'm glad to see, Tom, you're a great deal more respectful towards your elders than your sister. My wife tells me the girl was exceedingly rude to her last week. <laughs> well, sit down, sit down. How's your father? Oh, very much the same, I'm afraid, Uncle. He had some notion once of making you an engineer, I think. Yes, but I don't think I'd earn much money at that for a long while. Young men of your age don't make much money at anything. How are your accounts and bookkeeping? Oh, I know nothing of them, but I do write well. The best writing in the world won't get you a better place than copy clerk. What did you learn at school? Latin. A great deal of Latin. And some algebra and Greek history. Then hadn't you better get employment where such things will come in handy? Oh, no, Uncle, I'd rather enter some business like this, so I can get on as you have. Oh, ho, ho, ho. That's sooner said than done, young gentleman. To get on like I did, you must start at the bottom. I had no more schooling than a charity boy when I came to Guest and Co. But I pretty soon saw that I wouldn't get far without mastering accounts. So, I took lessons, between working hours, and paid for them, out of my earnings. I got it all by hard work, Master Tom. 
and picked up knowledge as I went along. Yes, that's what I want to do. <sighs> I got places, sir, because I made myself fit for them. If you wish to slip into a round hole, you must make a ball of yourself. You, young man, you know nothing at all about bookkeeping and even less about reckoning. You wouldn't even make a common shopman with your present knowledge. Latin's no use to you here. Dearest, are you sure you won't come up I'm with quite me? sure, thank you, Lucy, dearest. Those stairs would exhaust me. I should like you to meet my cousin, Tom Tulliver. Tulliver? Yes, I dare say I know the name, but then I know half the names of the neighbourhood in a detached sort of way. Stephen, shame on you. I've often talked to you about the Tullivers and cousin Maggie. Well, I dare say, Lucy. Well, you run along now. I shall, uh, I shall wait down here. Keep an eye on father's work. Make sure they're not slacking. I shall enjoy that. I don't think they will. Uncle, I just want to earn enough to keep my mother and sister. I don't care how unpleasant the work is. Well, I suppose you might be apprenticed to some business. A chemist and druggist, perhaps. Latin might come in a bit there. But your best chance would be a place on the wharf or in the warehouse. Might I do that, then? You wouldn't last a day. Standing in cold and wet and shouldered about by other fellas. That expensive education of yours has taken the rough out of you, young man, and whitened your hands like a girl's. You're too fine a gentleman now for the wharf. Oh, oh come in, my dear, come in. Tom was just leaving. Hello, Lucy. Has Maggie come to town with you? Uh, no, no, she didn't want to leave father. How is he? Very much the same, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm so sorry. Shall I visit him? Would he like that? Uh, uh, well, Tom, my boy, I think there's nothing more to be said just now. But, sir... Goodbye, my boy. Remember me to your mother. Goodbye, Lucy. <laughs> now, my dear. Oh, father, did you have to dismiss him like that? He was so upset. Hey. You must help him somehow. Promise me you'll try. Well, well, we shall see. The, the boys train for nothing. But I, uh... I might find him a temporary place in the warehouse. Papa, you're a darling. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, there's a possibility that things could still turn out well for neighbour Tulliver. How? Uh, we, uh, uh, Guest and Co., that is, are putting in a bid for the mill next week. Oh, that's wonderful. Then everything will be all right again. All guests must buy the mill. Things won't be all right in that family for a long time, my dear. But at least they'd not have to lose their home. an hour ago, but she said she'd be back before dark. I've had a fit, Maggie. Yes, Father. But you'll soon be well. Have we lost the mill, Maggie? No, nor shall we. The auction's on Friday, but guests are going to buy the property so that we can stay on here. Oh, that's capital. Capital. But I can't run a mill from my bed. Oh, you're not to worry about that now. You're to rest and get strong. <sighs> I'll not get strong with resting, lads. Luke has been to see you. And all the ants. And Bob Jakin. Do you remember Bob Jakin, Father? Maggie. If I die, Tom will have to take care of the both of you. He'll be badly off, I know, but even Tom must go and see and pay everybody. Oh, Father, don't talk so. Dr. Turnbull says you'll be on your feet in no time. There's 50 shillings Luke put into the business. You must pay him right away. I shall. But you'll soon be well enough to attend to everything yourself. Give us a kiss then, lass. Then let me rest, eh? Oh, Father. We all love you so much and pray for you to get well. This whole world's been too much for me, Maggie. I'd 
rascal Waco. He's done for me. Oh, Mr. Wakeham, sir. How good it is of you to see me without an appointment. A busy lawyer like you, sir. This is Tolliver, I think. The same, sir. Miss Elizabeth Dodson, as was, sir. I and I'm sure you remember my father. He was very close friends with Squire Darley, and we always went to dances there, the Miss Dodsons. The preppy seat is Mrs. Tolliver. Mrs. Gregg and Mrs. Dean are my sisters. I believe you know them. You have some business with me. I hope, sir, you're not thinking I bear you any ill will because of my husband. Do you have a question to ask me, Mrs. Tulliver? I'm sure I can't be answerable for all the abuse you've had to put up with from Tulliver. And as for that lawsuit... Madam, I'm extremely busy. Do you have a question for me? Yes, sir, I do. My husband hasn't been himself. Stuck like the death he was when he got that letter about you having a hold on his land. Yes, I had heard. I'm sorry he's in Not no that health. I'm defending him, mind, for all his fireness and his lawn against you. But there's worse men, Mr. Wakeham, sir. Tulliver never wronged anybody. Not willingly. I can't believe you'd want him to be so sick, so I know you'll behave like the gentleman you are. What does all this mean, Mrs. Tulliver? Mr. Wakeham, sir, please, don't buy the mill on the land. It would only make Tulliver worse if he thought you'd done that. Who told you I meant to buy it? My sisters and I thought you might want to buy it. Sir, if you don't bid for the mill and raise the price, then perhaps guests and co will buy it and let Tulliver work it as a tenant. Sit down, Mrs. Tulliver. Supposing I did buy the mill, why should I not allow your husband to work as my manager? Oh, but that's what I fear and dread, sir. That's why I'm here today to plead with you. Tulliver would never work for you, sir. Not if the mill itself begged him to. Why, your name's like poison to him, sir. He's looked on you as his ruination ever since you set the law on him eight years ago over that road through the meadow. And he's a pig-headed, foul-mouthed fool. Oh, he's so ill, Mr. Wakeham, sir. If you were to buy the mill, I'm sure he'd die. And you don't want a corpse on your conscience, do you? Mrs. Tolliver, I have business that must be attended to. Dolcott Mill has been in his family for three generations. Why, his grandfather built it. And they do say it will be unlucky if the mill ever changes hands and the water will all vanish. Madam, you must excuse me for interrupting, oh, but I really... Hasn't been, been punished enough, Mr. Wakeham, sir. He's done nobody any harm except himself and his family. I think there's nothing more to be said. Please don't let on I've come to see you. My son would be very angry with me for demeaning myself, and I'm in enough trouble without being scolded by my children. Good day, madam. See Mrs. Tolliver off the premises. Father. Which day is it that Dolcott Mill is to be sold? On Friday. Would you go to Winship's, Philip, and ask him to come over? The auctioneer? I think I have some business for him. You're surely not thinking of buying the mill, Father? Not too fond of men who openly revile me. Clients have withdrawn business after listening to Tolliver's lies about me over the dinner table. That lout has spent the last eight years trying to blacken my name. He should be taught a lesson. But haven't you already done that ten times over? <laughs> to belittle Tolliver now by buying his mill seems like... Well, like what? Speak up, lad. I'm sorry, Father. It just seems like sheer vindictiveness. Ah, Philip, Philip, I'll never make a lawyer of you, lad. You're too emotional. But then your mother was an emotional woman. I never scolded her for it. <laughs> Tolliver's nothing but another unsuccessful plaintiff to you, Father. A pitiable fellow with a hot temper. And a pretty daughter, eh? I know you're too well, my boy. I think you speak more for the daughter's sake than her father's. Am I right? 
Only yesterday you told me you had no intention of buying Duncan Mill. Yesterday I'd not met Mrs. Tulliver. 